to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ there was a man sent from god whose name was john john chapter 1 verse number six. We welcome you today to our study of great Bible characters. Today we're going to be thinking about one of the great unsung heroes of the New Testament, John the Baptizer. What a great work he did in preparing people for Jesus Christ. And so we're so glad that you've joined us for our program today. We hope that you'll Locate your Bible and have it ready as we're going to be looking to the Word of God in our study today. As always, we welcome you to our study of great Bible characters today. Um, this lesson, and as all of our lessons, are being brought to you by individual members and congregations of the Church of Christ, the Lord's Church in your area. They would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. You'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about lost souls, and more than anything else, want people to go to heaven. And so, won't you stop by their assembly on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday? and visit with these fine folks also here at the gospel of christ we'd love to help you in your study of the word of god check out our website thegospelofchrist.com from there you'll find a wide variety of good bible study material we have dvds and cds as well as audio lessons transcripts study questions all on our website, thegospelofchrist.com. You can access it free of charge 24-7. And if you'd like to have a copy of this lesson or any of our past lessons, whether topical or on every book of the Bible, we make those available to you on DVD or CD or digital download. Just go to our website, fill out a media request form, and we'll be happy to send that to you in the mail or through your computer as well. And then don't forget about the, uh, the Gospel of Christ app, both in the Apple and Android Play stores. It's free, and it's a great way to study the Word of God, get updates on our new lessons, notifications, all those things go with that as well. Today we're thinking about one of my favorite heroes in the New Testament, John the Immerser or John the Baptizer. This man stands out and he stands head and shoulders above everybody else in the Lord's estimation, speaking spiritually. And so what do we know about John the Baptizer? Here's a little bit of information just about his life. John's name means God is gracious. And it was a God-given name, Luke chapter, his name given by God is found in Luke chapter 1 verse 13. The grace of God, or God is gracious, is definitely seen in John preparing the way for Jesus, who is the grace of God. John chapter 1 verses 14 through 17. He was known, kind of what they called him, maybe we might even say nickname, John was known as the baptizer. That tells us how many people he baptized. He was actually known as the baptizer or the immerser, one who baptizes. He's called this in Matthew 3, 1, Matthew 11, 1. Uh, Josephus refers to it in his Antiquities, I believe chapter 18, verse, chapter 5, verse number 2, 18, 5, 2 in Josephus. In his Antiquities, he was preparing people by getting them baptized, preparing them for the Lord so much and so many people went out there that he was actually known as the baptizer. John received what I believe is one of the greatest compliments ever given anybody by Jesus Christ. Look in your Bible in Matthew chapter 11 and I want you to see what Jesus said. The compliment he paid John in verse number 11. The Word of God says this, Assuredly I say to you, among those born of women there has not risen, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Of anybody who's ever born among women, none is greater 
than John the baptizer. That shows us his work, his commitment, his level of dedication, the Lord's pleasure with what he did in getting people ready for him to come. We know of John, just as a little bit of biographical information as well, that John was born to a priestly family. Zacharias and Elizabeth, Luke chapter 1, verse 5, were of priestly family. And so he was born, born into great stock of the Hebrew uh, nation, but he went on to be a great prophet for Almighty God. He was, of course, the cousin of Jesus on the Lord's mother, on Mary's side, according to Luke chapter 1, verse number 36. John was actually six months older than Christ. Luke 1, verse 36 records that as well. He was a Nazarite from birth, meaning that taking that vow, being separated from certain things, and being specially dedicated uh, to the cause of God, Luke chapter 1, verse 15. And John was such an intriguing person, persona of that day, such a great prophet and worker for God that some actually thought John was the Messiah, according to Luke chapter 3, verse 15. And yet John would go on to say, He's not the Messiah. There's one coming after me whose shoes, in essence, I'm not worthy to tie. And so John played second fiddle really, really well. Now, when I think of John, there's some other things that stand out about his unique nature that are really practical uh, and interesting as well. John was kind of a, a rough and rugged type of individual, we might say. Uh, listen to, or notice in your Bible in Matthew chapter 3, notice what it says about John in Matthew 3 verse 4. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locust and wild honey. John was rather unique in that sense. Zechariah 13 4, uh, 2 Kings 1 8, there are several references that will go along with that, Elijah and Elisha and some of the things that are going on there and kind of uh, following the tradition of the prophets. But John was uh, really unique even in his dress, in his style, in his appearance, we might say. John was um, rather maybe reclusive by nature. Listen to Matthew chapter 11, verse 18. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The phrase eating and drinking was a common term for socializing, uh, social interaction, things like that. John didn't come eating and drinking. He wasn't the type who you'd see around in the big uh, areas where everybody was, rubbing elbows with everybody. He might have been more reclusive in his nature. But one thing for sure, John had a phenomenal influence for Jesus Christ. Notice Matthew chapter 3. I want you to look in Matthew chapter 3 with me in verse number 5. Look at John's influence. The Bible says this, Even though he was clothed with a camel's hair, leather belt, wild honey and locusts were his food. Look at verse 5. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the regions around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. And so when you think of John, even though he might have been a little different than what most people thought of in that day, he had such a powerful influence for Jesus Christ. And so I think about the impact and the influence one person can make if they really follow Christ. Friend, stop for just a moment and think about not just John's influence, but as we think about these great Bible characters in every one of our lessons, we want to make practical application. You can have, we can have, I can have, we can have a powerful influence for Christ as well, right? The Bible says in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. My influence in yours can have such a powerful impact on the world, on those in our family, those who we go to church with, what, what good we can do for the cause of Christ. Here's another unique fact about John's life that's often overlooked. John, the Bible tells us of John, that he was full of the Holy Spirit, and yet he never did one miracle. 
Look in Luke chapter 1 with me. That's an interesting fact because sometimes I hear people say that to know someone has the Holy Spirit, they'll be able to do miracles. Wait a minute now. That's not true. Look in Luke chapter 1. John was full of the Holy Spirit and he never did one miracle. Look in Luke chapter 1. And I want you to notice what the Bible says about this. And notice with me verse number 15. We're talking about John, and it says in verse 15, He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. Now watch this. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And so there's no doubt John was full of the Holy Spirit. But look in John chapter 10, if you would, in verse number 41. Look in John chapter 10, verse number 41. Notice what the Bible says here of John. Verse 40, And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. Then many came to him, to Jesus, and said, John performed no sign, but all things that John spoke about this man were true. John didn't do miracles. He wasn't a miracle worker, and yet John had the Holy Spirit to the fullest. And so the idea that you have to do a miracle if you have the Holy Spirit, that's just not true according to the Scripture. Now, think for just a moment then about some prophecies with me about John that kind of set the stage for his life. Isaiah 40 verse 3, there's a great prophecy about John that he's going to make the path straight. He's going to, the voice of one proclaiming, make his path straight, prepare the way for the Lord. You know, that was the whole work of John, to proclaim the way, to prepare the way for Christ, to make a path straight. When Jesus came on the scene, people were ready for that or should have been ready for it because of everything John did. Malachi 3 verse 1, he's prophesied to be a messenger from God who would prepare the way of Christ. And John indeed was a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, we're told that he was to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And we know, according to Luke 1, 16 and Matthew 11, verses 12 through 15, that John did that. And so he had a powerful ministry, powerful example, did great things for God and his kingdom. Now, let's think for just a moment about that proclamation, a voice crying in the wilderness. What was that voice crying? What was the powerful message that John preached that got so many people to the waters of baptism? First and foremost, John pointed people to Jesus Christ. Take your New Testament and look in John chapter 1. John pointed people to the Lord. Look in John chapter 1, verse number 29. The Bible says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so when we think about, about John, his message was all about Christ. He must increase, I must decrease, John would say. His message was pointing out that Jesus was that sacrificial Lamb of God. You hear that phraseology, Lamb of God. And you can't help but think of Exodus 12. You can't help but think about Exodus 16. You can't help but think about the book of Leviticus, those animals, the, the, the blood that was applied that saved their life, that, that went toward their sin, and how Jesus is the pure, perfect, spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so he pointed people to the Lamb of God, he pointed out Jesus as divine, as the Son of God. Look in John, you're not far from it. Look in John chapter 1, and I want you to notice what it says in verse number 34. John says this, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Who? That this Jesus, He's God. He's the Son of God. Anyone who's the Son of God is also God Himself. And so Jesus is God, divine. What else was John's message that really resonated with the people? 
I want you, this is really kind of the heart and core of his message. Look in Matthew chapter 3 with me, and I want you to see what John preached. You ever wonder what John might have said that really got people's attention? Look in Matthew chapter 3, and I want you to notice what the scripture says about John's message in verse number 2. Matthew 3, verse 2, the Bible records these words. Look at verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What was John's message all about? His message was a message of real change. Joel said it in the long ago in Joel 2, verse 13. Rend your hearts, tear your hearts, not your garments. You see, the Israelite people had gotten real good at plucking the hair out of their beard, tearing their clothes, casting sackcloth and ashes on themselves, outward signs of repentance, but real change? That wasn't part of their life. John's message was repent. Why, John? Kingdom's at hand. The kingdom that we've been looking for is getting close. Get ready for it by repenting and turning to God. John's message also, and no doubt this resonated with people as well, was a message of judgment. Look at Matthew chapter 3. Look what John says in verse number 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? John preached consequences. He preached wrath to come. A judgment day was coming and the people needed to repent and turn to God because of that. And so when I think about things that resonate with people's heart, don't get me wrong, we all want to hear encouraging, uplifting things that will motivate us. But you know, for the day and age in John lived, People needed to know Jesus was the Lamb of God. He was the sacrifice. He was the Son of God. They had to change what they were doing. And those people needed to do all of that in view of eternity, the judgment day. I wonder, is the message really much different than what people need to hear today? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the Son of God. I've got to change my life and turn from sin if I'm going to please Him, and I need to do all of that in view of the fact that one day the Lord's coming, or I'm going to leave this life, and I'll stand before the Almighty judgment seat of God. Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed a man once to die, and then the judgment. Messages like that remind us this is the temporal. We're headed toward the eternal side. Then let's think about for a few moments some practical lessons from the life of John. One practical lesson for families today from the life of John the Baptizer is this. John had a head start in life because of good godly parents. I want you to look at Luke chapter 1 with me. Would you turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 1 and we make this encouragement, we make this plea to parents today. John was ahead of others. He had a head start in life because of his parents' commitment to God. Look at Luke chapter 1 verse 6. The Bible says this, of John's parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments, commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Parents, we cannot begin to say how much good Zacharias and Elizabeth did in making John who he was. Listen to these words again. They were both blind, blameless. That is, if they found sin in their life, they dealt with it. They were honest about it and they dealt with it in a God-approved way. Both righteous, both walking in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Here you have a, a family, husband and wife, who are joined together, not working against each other, but who are both on the same page about raising their family and living their life by God's standards. What can we do to improve the home, the state of the home in America today? Just what Zacharias and Elizabeth did. Both blameless, both righteous, both walking in all the statutes and ordinance of the Lord. Both working together to raise a family of 
people based on God and His will is what's going to make our country, going to make the church great today. And so what a practical lesson that is. Then here's another one. Another practical lesson we learn from John in his life is that John taught a baptism similar to Jesus' baptism. Not the same. It was a preparatory, getting people ready for, but it was similar on certain levels. For example, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Luke chapter 3, verse 3 tells us that. Christian baptism is a baptism that requires repentance for the remission of sins also. Acts 2 verse 38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. John, in John's baptism, people acknowledge their sin prior to baptism. Matthew 3 verses 5 through 6. In Christian baptism, we realize all have sinned. Romans 3 verse 23, and we acknowledge our need for God and need to turn from sin. John baptized Jesus Christ, Matthew 3, verse, 5, uh, verse 15. Today, Christians are baptized into Christ. While John actually baptized the Savior, we're baptized into Christ today. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 27. A failure to be baptized by John was actually a rejection of God's will. Luke 7, verse 30, the Pharisees rejected the will of the God from themselves, not having been baptized by John. A failure to be baptized by John was a rejection of God's will. Not the final and ultimate baptism, but Jesus was the ultimate baptism. According to John 3, 1 through 5, it's what puts one into the kingdom, but a failure to obey God's will today. And be baptized is still a rejection of the commandments and will of God. Uh, baptism is a command. Acts chapter 10, verses 43 through 48. Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. They were baptized for the remission of their sins. Acts 22, 16. Acts 2, verse 38. When someone fails to do that for the reasons God sets forth, my well, friend, it's still a rejection of God's will. Let's now think about some practical lessons from John's life that really come forth in our life today. John wasn't afraid. Here's such a practical lesson. John wasn't afraid to speak the truth of God, even in difficult situations. In Mark 6, verse 18, John looked at uh, Philip and he said, It's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And you know what? That cost John his head. But he stood up and he stood for the truth on marriage, on divorce, on remarriage, on immorality. John stood up and said, this is not right. And friend, we need to say the same thing today. God's plan for marriage is one man, one woman for life. Genesis 2, 24, death ends that. Divorce for fornication on the part of the innocent ends that. Matthew 19, 9. But otherwise, people who get involved in relationships that are not right, are living in sin, Colossians 3, verse number 7. And so John stood up and spoke out about morality, even when it cost him greatly. John gave his life for the cause of Christ. Mark 6, verse 27 and 28, when Philip's wife heard what was said, and she pleased the king real well, he asked her, ask anything you want, half the kingdom, I'll give it to you. I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Couldn't go back on it. John lost his life. Galatians 2.20. He sacrificed himself for the cause of Jesus Christ. Another practical lesson. John got out of the way and he pointed others to Jesus Christ. I want you to hear the words of John 1. Verse number 27, when I think about great things about John's life, he wasn't in it for himself. He wanted to get out of the way and point people to Jesus. Listen to John 1, verse 27. John said, It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. I'm not worthy to untie his shoe. John said, John didn't mind playing second fiddle. He didn't need the limelight. He didn't need to be out front. He just wanted to put Jesus out there. And friend of my life and yours, that's what we want to do. I don't want to get in the way. I want to point, get out of the way and point people to Jesus Christ. John was known as a just and holy man. Mark chapter 6 verse 20 specifically identified as a just and holy man because of the life that he lived. 
You know, when our time is gone, what will we want to be remembered for? Wouldn't it be real good if people said he was a just and holy man? He tried to live by the Bible. He wasn't perfect, but he wanted to follow the teaching of Christ. John wasn't more worried about offending people than he was about saving souls. Recount this story to you. Matthew 3, verses 7 through 10. Everybody's coming out to be baptized by John. The Jewish elite of that day, who are definitely not, return, not turning from their sin, they want to come out, and the reason is because everybody's doing it. And so John says to those people, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? John pointed out that they were deceptive, they were cunning, but they were not willing to change their life, and that they had no right to be baptized until they changed their life. Might that have hurt some people's feelings? Might that have offended some? Maybe, but John told them what they needed to hear. And the Bible says in Galatians 4, 16, Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Today, men and women need to hear that without Jesus, there's no hope. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Him. John 14, 6. People need to hear you can't keep living in sin and think everything's going to be okay. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. People need to know that hypocrisy and playing church and acting like you're the Lord's best friend and living like the devil the rest of the time is not going to work. You cannot do that. Just like John called those people brood of vipers, We've got some of their kinfolk around today who want to play church, who want to act like they're godly, and then go live like the devil the rest of the time. Friend, if a person's really going to please God, he's got to commit to Jesus Christ every day. And so we ask you today, have you committed your life to Christ? Are you a Christian? Have you heard the Word of God? John 8, verse 24, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Do you believe that? with all your heart? Would you repent of sin and turn to God? Matthew 3, verses 5 through 8. Would you confess Him as Lord and Savior? And would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Acts 2, verse 38. We hope you'll join us next time as we're going to study more from the Almighty Word of our God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the